meeting with Greg Valentine. That was good. It was interesting. Greg was a, a totally different, conflicting styles, which made the tag team work. Right. A tag team. Both guys do not need to be the same. Did you work like working uh, tag or singles? Yeah, you know, I broke into business as a tag team wrestler. I'd been in tags until I went to Calgary, until I went to Calgary and then to New York. And even in Calgary, I was very seldom a single. I was in tags most of the time, me and Schultz and then me and Ron Starr as tag team champions and myself and the Cuban assassin up there. I had always been in tags. Myself and Dutch Mantel were the tag team champions in Puerto Rico for a year. Uh, always in tags. So tags came easy. And I knew that no matter what style Greg had, I could adapt and make, make it work because with his wrestling brute strength style, slow and determined, my show business bullshit made a good tag team. It, makes, it really makes for a good team. If both guys look the same, if both guys act the same, if both guys do everything the same, then you're not, you're not getting any kind of a difference there. It was a a good spot for both of us at the time because I had gone through a program now with Snuka and, and, and I had gone through with okay, about Snuka. I had gone through with uh, the Warrior and did the return matches with the Warrior for three or four months with the World Warrior where I'm gonna get my belt back and Warrior beats me every night which makes him stronger. Then came Snuka. They Snuka came in and I went to I went to Vince and I said, because we're there again. You gotta be thinking on your feet in this business. Here Jimmy Snooker was, he was a god. He was next to Hogan as far as what people saw in him. And he had left the WWF on a $30,000 $30, a week or something, walked out, quit. Thirty grand a week, serious big money. Nothing like what Hogan was making. Right. At the time, when Jimmy left four years before that, thirty grand was a lot of money. And he was on top doing sellout business. I see him, I know he's coming in, and I go to Mike Mann and I ask him, can you know, Mind me work a little program with Snook off. I'll, I'll, I'll try to help get him over. Well, that's just what a promoter wants to hear. I'll help get him over. I'm not going to be a problem. And you know what? I made as much money working with Jimmy in the Scranton, Pennsylvanias, and the small clubs around uh, the country as I did working the bigger shows. I made the same money. It's, it's something. So obviously, played into Mac Man's hand there, and it gave Jimmy somebody who was not going to beat up on him and hurt him. Right. They got him ready for Kurt Henning and then him and Henning had a program. But at the end of that, they had put uh, uh, Greg and I together then and said, we need to do something with both of you because Greg's run had finished and, and everything. My run had now finished after four years. And it came up and here again, Rick Rude, God bless him. I mean, he was a great guy. Just sad, sad, sad story about what happened to him. Anyway, we are in the locker room, and Patterson came out of TV day, and they know they're going to send us out there, but they needed a name for us. And Pat Patterson came in, he's looking at Greg, he's looking at us, he said, you guys got it, we got to come up with a name for you before we go out tonight. And we just said, okay, we'll think about it, think about it. Rude turned around and said, I got it. How about Rhythm and Blues? Rhythm and Blues? Patterson looks at him, Rhythm and Blues. He says, yeah, that's him. You know, he's a honky-tonk man with all the rhythm and everything. There's Greg sitting there half dozy asleep. <laughs> he's always down in the dump, the blues. Great, great idea. I'll go tell Vince. And that was it. That was how Rhythm and Blues was born. Then they got the great idea. Let's dye Valentine's hair black. Right. Which was a great, I mean, it was, Valentine hated it. He hated it. It was a great piece of business. Now here, I'm, a, I'm all of a sudden I'm in a tag match we call Rhythm and Blues, and here's a guy, he's out there with a guitar, and he's got long, stringy, ugly black hair. Right. You know, it was, a, it was really, really good. It would have made for good television. But we happened to be behind the eight ball. They had the Nasty Boys. They had... Uh, Arn and Tully just came in. Arn and Tully. They had the Powers of Pain, uh, Rock and Roll Express. Not Rock and Roll Express. Rock Mid Rockers. Midnight Rockers, they had uh, uh, the Rougeaus, they had the Dynamite Kid and Davy Boy, they had Brett and Jim was still together at that time, uh, I think, and, and they were pursuing the Road Warriors. We were in the office talking to Mike Mann about getting the belts. We were going to beat the Hearts and be the tag champions. Right. Uh, we, Rhythm and Blues was, which would have been tremendous for television. It would have been a great piece of work, I think. 
the heat we would have had because people hated us. Right. And Greg with the hair and picking to get the. We were in the office meeting with Mike Mann and talking about how we'd like to have the belts and take a quick run at it and see what we could do when he got the call that the Road Warriors were signed and sealed. Right. We were the odd man out. Didn't need didn't need us now as a team anymore. We were just a a safety valve. And once he secured them and they came in, that was it for us. They let Greg go. Fired him. Told him they were done with it. Call me up and tell me they're sending me over to T V. Hmm. I'm gonna be a commentator now with Piper. I'm gonna be sitting there with Daffy Duck. <laughs> you know, you can't get a word in edgewise with Piper. Not only is he all substance abused up at the time and everything else, but mind you, he's wanting to secure a position at the table, which is a hard, hard spot to break into because there's more animosity, more backstabbing that goes on, especially when Vince was sitting at that commentating table with the guys that was there beside him. Hmm. Everybody wanted that chair beside Mike Mann. That meant security, stability, prestige amongst the wrestlers and the office people, you were treated different. Right. Yeah. How about uh, Dusty Rhodes? I think you worked a little bit with him. Had a few matches with old Dusty, the biggest liar is he lies as big as his belly is. Uh, you know, old Dusty told us all, hey baby, hey baby, when I, I get the job, Ted Turner, you to bring me down, I'm gonna bring all you guys with me. You be with me, baby. Yeah, lying sack of shit. He wouldn't even take our phone call. I never called him anyway. You know, he pulled me off to the side prior to us going in that SummerSlam match and because he, he had he had known then that he was probably going to take the Turner job and go there. He met with him and talked to him. He calls me off to the side that night before the match. Hey, baby, I know you're unhappy here and everything. Listen, I got something cooking. When I get it, you're going to be there with me. All okay, right. here's my number, Dusty. If it happens, I'd sure like to do it because nothing happened here for me. Yeah, baby, don't you worry. Nope. Well, he never called any of us. Coco, in fact, Coco beware. Coco uh, tried to call there. Dino Bravo tried to call there. Ricky Martel tried to call there. He wouldn't even take their calls. He told all of us, "Hey, baby, you got a job with me?" As far as Snuka was, he easy to work with. Yes. Uh, except for that damn splash. Right. Holy shit, man, that thing hurt. <laughs> uh, hard, hard foundation. Your series with them. Did Brett improve a lot from the Stampede days? Mm, no, not really. He he improved in tag team because he was always a single in Stampede and his tag matches, which he'd had a year. You know, he had always, he had been working with Dynamite and Davey for 10 years in Calgary before, and you know, people look back and say, oh, the Hart Foundation and the British Bulldogs had classic great matches. Well, my God, if I go out there with, with, uh, with uh, Ricky Martin and Robert Gibson, me and Larry Latham, as, as, and we had wrestled them guys a thousand times. We'd have tremendous great matches with them. Right, right. They'd been working together for ten years. They should have had great matches. But uh, tag team wise, Brett and Jim, there, there it was again. Here's Brett, who was the technician, the real wrestler in that team, and Jim was the big anvil, who couldn't even, who couldn't do anything. But yet they had a great tag team, and that's what you have to have. Now you also worked uh, Hogan in '89, I think, right? I had a few shots, right. not many. Once again, my, another Mac Man promise when I first came there was a big run with Hogan. You get the big run with Hogan, you're talking, like I said, in, instead of making ten thousand a week with the Intercontinental Belt, now you're making fifteen, eighteen, twenty, thirty thousand a week with Hogan. Kamala, three shots with Hogan, eighteen thousand dollars. Three shots, he gets mad and quits. Uh, Orndorff, one show with Hogan, 50 grand in Toronto. I mean, this was serious money to, to work on top with Hogan. I was promised that run, and I always wanted that run. I thought, me with the Intercontinental Belt going against Hogan, belt versus belt, title versus title, I'll have both those belts at the end of the night around the country would have been great business. It did sell out to Meadowlands. We did it once. Sold out. Turned people away. I made eight grand for that show that night in the Meadowlands. And it's funny, I worked with Steamboat, it was sold out, I made six. I don't understand it. But anyway, <laughs> that's the difference. I would have had seven nights a week with Hogan at seven or eight thousand a week. You're talking sixty, seventy thousand a week. Incredible. <laughs> now, Boss Man got that run. He didn't deserve it, he got that run. DiBiase came in and had that run for a year with, with Andre and Hogan on top. That was a serious run. Uh, Rick Rude got the run with Hogan. 
Dino Bravo got to run with Hogan. Like I said, Kamala got to run with Hogan. Jake got to run with Hogan. Savage got two or three runs with Hogan. Now think about that. Savage not only got to run as a heel a couple of times with Hogan, but then came back as a baby face and got to run with Hogan. Right. And it's like I said, when you're talking seven, eight thousand dollars a night, and we did seven, we did six, five days a week, and four on Sunday. That's nine shows. Let's just say nine times eight. Y'all do the math. Seventy-two grand a week. Now that's what the guy made that worked against Hogan. What was Hogan making? Right. You see, now. Hogan's in WCW at $4 million a year, they say. If he went to Bischoff and said, Eric, you know, this is my friend, he came here, you know, give him 50 grand a year. Is that going to hurt Hogan? Is that going to take any money out of his pocket? For Christ's sakes. But keep in mind, if Hogan made 50, 60, 100 grand a week, what was McMahon making? He's making 20 times that. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> now, Undertaker, when he first came in, you were with him, I believe, right? Uh, I was there for the... That is that is the day that McMahon said that he'd let Greg go. That was the Thanksgiving Survivor Series of 90. That was his first time in. That's when they had the gobbledygooker there. That right. Night. Phew, boy. <laughs> anyway, uh... uh that's that's the day that he told me I'm going over and do commentary. So that was my last, that was really my last big show in the WWF for them guys. I was not around uh, Undertaker that much. Uh, seemed to be a pleasant guy, nice guy. That is one gimmick. That's one I have to step up the plate and say, I never thought it'd work. Right. I never thought this one would get over. You know, here's a guy. He's walking out there. He's painting. And this was the first guy that that really went into a makeup chair, had a costume made for him. And everything. We all had our own stuff done. We didn't go set and do. We all did our own makeup. You know, the Road Warriors did their own makeup. They made up their own costumes. But here's a guy who went and they sat down. It was just like a Hollywood set. Right. They made him up. He put the costume on. He goes out like a dead man, gives his tombstone, puts the guy in a body bag. We all said, we all farted at it. That's dead. Never going to happen. But that's, that's a credit to his talent. He was able to get that over. Very much so. Now, the big question is being the American badass, uh, by the time this plays or whoever buys this or looks at this tape, uh, I don't know. Is he able to get the badass over with the motorcycles? Somebody's already done that. So right. I think his days as the Undertaker probably finished. It just doesn't mix in with the the kind of style they have going right now. What are your memories of uh, Curry Von Erich in the WF? Oh, boy. <laughs> Curry was out there somewhere that no man's ever been before. Uh, that's a sad story, but there again, I know kids, promoters kids and how the promoters kids are, you know, the promoters kids think because these are dad's toys, they're my toys too, so the kids tend to play around with people and people's lives that they shouldn't and Von Erichs wasn't exempt from that, neither were the Hearts or any of these other kids of promoters around. Uh, Carrie. I mean, I was in an interview room one day. We used to have to stand and wait on one guy to do his interviews. You know, he might have two cameras going in two different rooms. But, you, know, you got 30 guys to do 30 interviews. And Kerry was in there for over an hour one day with one cue card, but he couldn't even read the cue card and say the name of the town and, and what time of the show was, you know. It's Saturday night. It's Madison Square Garden. We're kicking it off. It's 8 o'clock, the biggest card of all time. I mean, come on, Kerry, for Christ's sakes. Can't you say it's next Saturday night in Scranton, Pennsylvania at the Catholic Youth Center? I mean, it took like 60 minutes for him to get this thing. And we're all waiting. It's 60 minutes for us to wait. Please. But uh, he took that GHB stuff or something on an airplane, and they had to land the plane and take him to the hospital. And just a mess. Just a mess. I only, you know, I only worked one match against Kerry. It was an independent show somewhere, and he was fine. We had a good match. He was a good worker in the ring. Nothing wrong with his work. Right. How about Shawn Michaels? What was he like back then? Shawn Michaels in the early days was a nice guy. Uh, he's got a, a partner, Marty Gennetti. He's a real nice guy. Marty's got some demons he deals with. But Marty's a real good guy, first-class gentleman. If Marty knows you, he knows you. 
Uh, if he's seen you before, he's going to be nice to you. Uh, Shawn Michaels, once again, he rubbed up against McMahon. Some of McMahon rubbed off on him. Shawn turned out to be a complete asshole. I mean, just a complete asshole. Now, how did you wind up leaving WF after you did the commentary? It was a case of them. My name wasn't on the booking sheet anymore. They sent me a check. They sent me $1,000 a week. Did you leave on good terms? Or? I would say so. I just asked for a release. That was as good as any could be, I guess. They, uh, I went to the, I went to King of the Ring. Hamsley was hurt. They flew me out. I flew out to do some kind of personal appearance for them. They hadn't used me since the wrestle, no, since uh, the Brett deal where Brett smacked McMahon. Uh, that was uh, Survivor Series, I guess it was. Right. In December, they called me to come out in January to do a personal appearance somewhere in California. And I just happened to be in the same town that the Raw was that day. So I went down to the building because my ticket sent me home the next day. And Hemsley was hurt, and Patterson came over and asked me, would I mind being in the Royal Rumble? Well, you want to be in the Royal Rumble? Hamsley's hurt, and we got to find somebody. I said, well, I don't see why I can't. Uh, I wrestle for everybody else in the country. I don't know why I can't work for you guys. Right. Because they've not used me for a year. Put me on some commentary, and that was it. Uh, I did the, the King of the Ring for them, and they didn't call me back again. And he called me three months later and said, we need you to do a, a, train, a bus ride from Connecticut to Boston for the WrestleMania with some sponsors. And I did the bus ride myself in Slaughter. Went to the WrestleMania, stayed for, had lunch and left, and went back to the hotel and flew home. Then they didn't call me back again. The booking sheet came out, my name wasn't on it. I wasn't on anything for three months. And this was in what, WrestleMania's March. But in the meantime, I was still having to clear all of my dates with Jim Ross. I was constantly getting independent dates. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Go to the Raw on Monday, stay for Tuesday, go home. Sometimes I wouldn't even stay for Tuesday, go but I had to clear my dates with Ross. So then it got to the point where instead of him clearing the date right away, they'd string me along for a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. I'd fax them back, fax them back. I couldn't call because they never answered the phone. Right. Fax them back, I need to be cleared on this right away. Because the independent promoter said, listen Wayne, gosh, I got to get my advertisement out. I mean, I got your name on a poster. Are you going right. to be there? I got to buy your plane ticket. I mean, what, what's happening? The independents had kept me alive since since December of 1990, and I was not going to trample on those guys. A lot of them were legitimate, good independent promoters who were loyal to me, and I still work for them. You know the Killer Kowalskis and, and, and the, the 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 Danny down here in Baltimore and different places around the country. Uh, they give me four or five shows a year, and I was not going to trample on those guys just because now I'm back with WWF. So uh, it got to the point where I got tired of it. I just stopped clearing the dates and went out and did my own thing. And finally in August, I faxed McMahon a note and said, uh, just want to know if you're going to renew the contract of the greatest intercontinental champion of all time. <laughs> if not, I need to know. Right. He faxed me back and said they have no plans on renewing me at this time and uh, a release would follow. Right. That's great. So that was it. How'd you wind up in WCW? <laughs> and what were your early impressions of Eric Bischoff? <laughs> oh, oh boy, you got about 10 hours now. Uh, I knew from speaking with Jimmy Hart uh, that they were, that Hogan was going to go there and Hogan wanted to take some ex WWF guys with him, like I said earlier, to make some kind of an impact so that he wasn't just there alone, right. uh, going against Flair and Flair's Four Horsemen and all the WCW stuff that they had going on. Hogan wanted to make a big impact and have people around him that he could trust and communicate with. You know, he doesn't really like to be isolated sitting in his own locker room. He likes to see the honky-tonk man every now and again or the Bushwhackers or, or uh, uh, Snooker or Jake if he could. Because it, it brings back memories and it's people that you trust to be around. Uh, so I, I told Jimmy, yeah, I'd be interested. You know, I, I would, sure, I'm not doing anything now. I'd been teaching school. I'd quit teaching school. I'd moved to Arizona. And, Started back on the independent. But I get a call one day just before I moved to Arizona and finished Ric Flair on the phone. Now, here this no good son of a bitch is, and he's saying, uh, you know, Eric's been talking about you and Jimmy Hart, and you know we got Hogan coming in and we can make some changes in WCW. Could uh, 
we'd like for you to come in. We're taping at Disney uh, next week. We'd like for you to come in. We want to get a look at you. I said, uh, well, Rick, what do you mean get a look at me? Well, you know, bring a guy in, get a look at him, see if he... I said, you know me for 20 years. You know what I look like. I said, that is, I said I'm not going to come in for a tryout match. You guys know what I can do. I, I, I sold as many tickets as anybody in the WWF. I think I can do it. Well, yeah, yeah, you're a big draw there. And we'd like to have you here. Well, what kind of money can I make? Well, I don't do the money. You have to talk to Eric about that. I said, well, Rick, you know, there's no need for me to talk to you. Have Eric call me. Now, if he can't talk about the money, then let me talk to the guy who's going to be signing the checks. I mean, there's two sides to the ends to the horse. There is his head and there is his ass. And, and I didn't want to talk to the other end. A month goes by, I move to Phoenix, get settled in, just get in my house, Jimmy Hart calls. Eric's going to call you, you're home, yeah, he calls me, bring me in, I want to bring you in, talk to you, Jimmy Hart's pestering me. They bring me into Disney. Eric Bischoff standing outside. He's talking to Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I walk up. Hey, Hack, how you doing? Hey, honey, we hug. Stick my hand out. He says, I'm Eric Bischoff. I'm Honky Tonk Man. He says, yeah, I know who you are. He said, I've never been a big fan of yours, but Jimmy Hart just kept pestering me. I thought I'd have to bring you in to get him off my back. <laughs> I said, well, I hope I can change your mind. Maybe we can do some business here. He walked away. I went to the payphone once again, called my wife. I said, I won't be here long. She said, oh, what happened now? <laughs> I said, you're not going to believe this, but the guy that signs the checks and makes the contract says he's not a big fan of mine. And believe me, folks, if your boss is not a big fan of yours, you're not going to be there in that company very long. So that's kind of how it happened with him. I could tell he was an egotistical maniac, a power-hungry little man. Uh, I saw him later that day and said you know we need to when can we sit down and talk he said i want to bring you over to the office and talk to you about a contract okay when he said next week i flew back to phoenix back to atlanta we'd like for you to live in either in tampa or live in in atlanta we do all our work here i just moved to phoenix i said wait a minute you know we'd really like for that but you don't have to right now we got some real bad contracts he said there's some real bad contracts here, and I've got to try to clear them up. A lot of them are coming due, and I'm not going to renew them, and when I get some money freed up in November, I'm going to get you a good contract. I'll make you more money than Vince McMahon ever made you. I said, well, that's great. That's great. I appreciate it. I'll do whatever I can to help you. That's how it ended. Nothing else was said. I never said another word, never did anything except what they told me. I showed up. I fly over there, work one match, fly back to Phoenix, fly back over there two days later, work two matches, fly back, November came and went. Then I hear that Brad Armstrong comes to me and says, Wayne, you ain't going to believe it. My contract, is, it, it, he said, my contract was up last week. They didn't, even, they didn't call me in, didn't say nothing. I didn't say nothing to them. Hell, it got renewed for three more years. He said, I ain't, I ain't even worked here in a year. I said, well, I said, I wish they'd give me one. Then I read in a newspaper where the Steve Regal had called the Miami newspaper writer who wrote about wrestling and said that he was upset and he might be leaving uh, the WCW and look for the WWF for a contract. Bischoff automatically signed him for 175000 gave him a raise or something. Then they bring Savage in. I heard 450000 that first contract deal with Savage. This was all in November. Now right. November had came and went now. Here I sit. Well, what's going to happen? Then came for the John. Then came time for the Johnny B. Bad finish. And Mike Graham struts over there and tells me. I told a wife before I left home that day. Before I left home, I was packing my bag. I said, "I got a funny feeling I'm gonna be quitting tonight." She said, "You always say that." Well, you always. I said, "No, I got a real funny feeling about this. They're gonna ask me to do this job for this kid tonight, and I'm not doing it. If they don't give me a contract, I'm walking." I didn't get a contract, and I walked. But the sad thing about this is, normally, normally when you negotiate, they had had me, they had me on TV, every television show for four straight months, promos, beating all their guys, everything. Why not capitalize on that investment at least, if nothing else, the short term for that night? Right. When I said I'm not going to put this guy over. Okay, what can we do for tonight? 
Bischoff totally closed the door on negotiations. He came out, backed himself up against the wall, stood there like he's like he's in a shoot fight or something. And I said, Eric, what's the deal? I said, he said, what do you mean, what's the deal? I said, what's what's the deal? You are. Once again, I had a deal with Bischoff. I said, Eric, I'll give you the same deal I gave Vince. Use me on TV, treat me right, no jobs on TV. Put me in a position, if I draw, pay me. If I don't, you don't owe me anything. He said, yeah, that is our deal. I said, then what's, what's, what's the deal with the job on TV? He said, it's not a job on TV. This is a pay-per-view. I said, it's still television to me, Eric, without a contract because I'm still an independent. Well, you're not going to hold me up for money. I never even mentioned money. All right. So right away, the door was closing. I tried to open the door by saying, Eric, I'm not trying to hold you up for money. I'd just like to know if I've got a job here tomorrow, if I go out and do this tonight. Well, with the rate you have right now, I was making 1200 a show there. With the rate you have right now, you'll do well over $200,000 next year. I said, yeah, I will if I work on all those shows. I said, half the time these shows get canceled because there's not enough people here. Right. Well, if you don't want to do it, we can't use a guy that don't want to go with the program. Once again, he slams the door. I try to open it. Eric, it's not that I don't want to go with the program. I just want to know that I'm part of the program. Well, if you don't want to do this, we can't use you. At that point, I'd had enough. And he said, besides, you did jobs for Mac Mann. That ain't got a fucking thing to do with it. I mean, I was so mad at that point. My, I was just furious because that had nothing to do with it. I had not even seen Vince McMahon in six or seven years. And now this guy tells me, well, if you don't want to do it, you can. we don't need you. Besides, you did jobs for Mac Mann. I tried to open that door one more time. I said, Every job I did for Mac Man, I got paid for. And a hell of a lot more than what you're paying. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Catch you down the road. I stuck my hand out, he shook it, and I walked out. My music was playing, and I got in a cab and left. Yeah, that's just how it went. No, no Jimmy Hart calling me, no Jimmy Hart running behind me, nothing. Nothing. Just Hogan. Hey, brother. Hey. Hey, brother, wait a minute. Brother, you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I said, the light you see at the end of that tunnel and the light I see is a total different color. Mine is green. It's money. And I said, I came here for you to help you. Nobody else. And if you can't stick for me, then who can? Brother, I'm just I'm just trying to protect myself. I said, that's fine. I thought you was the man, but you ain't the man. You're a piece of fucking shit. I walked away. That's the last I've said to him. And when they called him an old bald-headed son of a bitch, when Vince Russo called him that on a pay-per-view and he sued the WCW because they called me dirty names, they insulted me in front of my family, my children, my wife, then what did you have your children and wife sitting in the front row of that TNA show that they got going in the WCW? Well, you know, there's some dispute about whether or not he's old, whether or not he's bald-headed, or whether or not he's a son of a bitch. Well, I'm sure that if they go to court, there's somebody going to say, yeah, he is old, he's nearly 50, he is bald-headed, and there's probably somebody like me who step forward and say, yeah, he's a son of a bitch, too. So his case is going nowhere. Total difference. And... Uh, well, now, now, when I was there two years ago in WWF, it was the exact same because the same guys in WCW. And mind you, with guys that's got contracts like they had in WCW when I was there, uh, everybody's got a contract. Everybody knows their position. They know their, they know their role. As uh, one of the guys in WWF used, to, I think Rocky used to say that. Know your role. Uh, they knew their role, they knew their position, and uh, it was easy. They'd come in, do their job, get their money. The checks came every two weeks, whether you worked or you didn't work. You could stay home for six months, still draw checks, same way in the WWF nowadays, uh, as opposed to years ago when there was that scheming, conniving, backstabbing. 
let me let me give you a little history uh, real quick about you know we talk about Hogan and all the things how I feel about him and my friend Dr. D. David Schultz had a big blow up with Hogan and eventually Dr. D went after Hogan and went after Mr. T and uh, told Mac Man that he knew where he lived and he was going to get Mac Man so Mac Man put 24 hour security guards around his house office building over where it's as secure as the White House right now you can't even go from floor to floor or room to room in some cases without using your security card at that office only because they were so afraid of David Schultz <laughs> and, and yeah, Hogan's afraid of Schultz even to this day sooner or later David Schultz run across Hogan again but as we drove the highways in Pensacola and Tennessee and different places David was always thinking about ways to draw the big crowd the big show and Austin Idol, as I mentioned before, Idol was in, in and around, and Idol, Hogan took this from Idol. Hey, it's Idol Mania! It's Idol Mania running wild! Hey, it's Uncle Mania running wild! He took that from Idol, Idol Mania. Then Schultz picked up on an idea called, let's call it WrestleMania. Let's make it a big event. Let's have, you know, Muhammad Ali have Mr. T, because Mr. T was real hot with the A team right. and all that. Have, you know, had this big show. David talked about this big show for two years and call it WrestleMania. Then he gets over to Minneapolis, and of course, probably when they were sitting around at nighttime and they were doing all the nighttime activities that the wrestlers do, and, you know, sometimes the old ganja makes you think all kind of thoughts. They probably talked about it, and Hogan was living with David in the apartments in the same apartment complex in Minneapolis. And the whole WrestleMania. Mr. T, Mr. T, WrestleMania. That's it. All started right there. And Hogan gave it to Mac Man, him and Schultz, because they came to WWF as a package against each other. No one does not. Okay, that's but when it came to the actual WrestleMania, David had, on the instructions of Mac Man, slapped John Stossel. So they thought he had too much heat on him. They didn't want to use him now in this big event. There was some heat going on between Hogan and, 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 and Dr. D. It was all Dr. D's idea, the whole thing, to even get Mr. T and even get Muhammad Ali and all these celebrities and make it a big star study event. And to think that someone would take your idea and to use that idea and you not be a part of it is enough to break a man. And that broke David Schultz because, and he blames Hogan for this, they used Piper and Orndorff against Hogan and Mr. T instead of David Schultz and Piper or David Schultz and Orndorff. That was Schultz's spot, and he got bumped out of it. The biggest event in the history of our business, the, the WrestleMania 1, will always be the biggest because it started it. Right. And he got bumped out of that, and he was never the same anymore after that. Never the same towards anybody. And I, and I, as Bill Clinton would say, I feel his pain. To think that someone would take something of yours like that, use it every way you say it, and then not even make you a part of it. So that's where Hogan... It started a long time ago. It wasn't just something that probably he rubbed off from Mac Man. Do you think Vince tried to use Jeff Jarrett basically to copy your gimmick? Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a slap back to me. That's what it was. Right. He he actually used it. He tried it before with someone else, uh, Lance Cassidy, the singing cowboy, which was one of the Armstrong boys, I right. think. That it didn't get over. Then Jarrett. That brings me to the Jeff Jarrett situation that people say, how do you feel about that? Well, in a way you should feel honored that someone would want to copy you in, in some fashion of what you did. You obviously made an impact on someone, but in another way, this guy's been around 15 years. He's not some young kid in the business. Right. He hasn't been able to get over in any place he's ever been other than his daddy's territory. If you're going to take someone's gimmick, then you better do it better than that guy. And if you can't, then get rid of it. Don't use it. He used it once in the WWF, and I think, sure, that was Vince's way of slapping me, making a mockery out of me and the gimmick. 
Jeff didn't get over with it. He goes to WCW. He doesn't use it at all. He comes out and tries to be himself. He doesn't get over, but he doesn't get over because they put the big titted broad with him right. with a blonde hair. She stood out more than him. The worst thing you can do is have a valet that is so gorgeous or so beautiful or takes all the attention away from the wrestler. If she takes the attention away from you, you're dead. Right. She's the star, not you. He was obviously stupid and didn't understand that. He goes back to the WWF, and this is, an, uh, this is where I was getting, a, like David getting slapped in the face. I'm in the locker room of the WWF when they bring him back. They put him in the rhinestone suits, put him on a horse, give him a manager, give him some bogus NWA belt. I'm in the locker room sitting there. They don't even use me. I sat there for 12 hours every Monday, never even mentioned my name. And then they give him the guitar and he goes out and uses it while I'm sitting there. Now I know why they did that. But if I had been Jeff Jarrett, obviously he's got no backbone or no professionalism. If I had been him and they told me to do that, I'd say, you know, that's his gimmick. He's, he's, you know, I don't want to do that. Right. You know, not while he's here. I mean, if you guys get rid of him or something, then fine. But, you know, I really don't want to. He, he didn't do that. He played the game with them. So you got to think, well, I'm not around anymore. They're going to continue to do it. So fine. No problem. That's the second time they've done it. It didn't get over. But the idiot, this dumb son of a bitch, goes to WCW and carries that gimmick with him again. It's, it gets to be a point where you say, the hell with this guitar. I, ain't, I don't want it anymore. I want to get over as myself. Right. I want to get over as a new gimmick. I've tried this thing three times now, and it didn't work. I don't want any girls with me. I, don't, I want to go out here and get over. Obviously, he can't get over. He's not going to get over. He's a small guy. He's a mid-card wrestler, and he's not going to get over. And, 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 and it's, it's bad. It's bad because if I took Bill Dundee's Elvis gimmick, and I've seen Bill a bunch of times, and I told Bill, I said, I would never have come to Memphis and used that. Somebody gave it to me in another territory, and I did it. But when I went back to Memphis, I didn't go back there as a honky-tonk man. I never would have done that because I had a professional courtesy to somebody. You don't do it. If you take his gimmick and you go off to California and you use it, well, California TV doesn't bleed into Memphis. But once I went to the WWF, I perfected the gimmick and made it much more stronger than Bill ever knew how to do it. So I expounded on it. I made it bigger. There's never been but one Hulk Hogan. There's never been but one Roddy Piper. What I don't understand is that Mac Man, he obviously either hates me so much or he likes me, he liked my gimmick so much. Why doesn't he ever bring somebody and have him be the snake? Why don't he have Austin, the rattlesnake, tow the snake around? Why don't he have somebody go out and blow the bagpipes like Piper? Why don't he call somebody Mr. Wonderful like he did Paul Orndorff? He's never done that. I have been the, really the only gimmick, other than the Rick Rude, and Rick's not around anymore, that they used the stripper gimmick like Rick Rude did, the dancing with Val Venus. Venus. But mine has been the only one that they've actually taken and totally used the pieces of the gimmick. Jarrett now goes out and hits five guys. The guitar explodes like paper and everybody, if they think it's a sham. So whatever he's done, they hadn't killed me. They've made me stronger because people say, that, that guitar he used, that's, that's nothing but paper. Hey, brother, when you hit him, you knock the shit out of him. All right. All right. Did you see uh, a lot of potential in The Rock? I knew that from the very beginning. Uh, somewhere, somehow, there's probably a tape of a Raw show where Ross is going, you know, this is a... Uh, he played football in Miami! Who gives a shit about football at so-and-so? But anyway, he, he was Rookie of the Year, and I said, because I, well, I'm looking for my... This is three months, and I'm looking for my protege, somebody who can fill my shoes, please. Huh. Anyway, I said, I, I said, and I made that statement on TV, I said, he's not only the Rookie of the Year, he's the only one here with any talent. Wow. What about and he Steve? was. What about Steve this, this Rocky kid, he's, he, here's what he's got that WWF likes. Size. He's big, he looks good, and he can talk. Yeah. And he can work. He can, he can, he can work, and he can talk. Uh, Austin, you know, flash in the pan, really? Is he going to last 10 years? No, no. Bad neck, two knee braces, he looks like a guy in a wheelchair. It's over when you go out there with two knee braces. And now that you got a bad neck, you can't do. This is the thing about cactus. 
Cactus came off the cage, went through the floor, went through everything. When he comes back, if he can't do those things he did before, people are going to fart at him. Well, he's not as good as he used to be. See, you can never box yourself in right. to that kind of a corner. He painted himself in a corner now, so with Austin. Austin's two leg braces, hurt neck. He can't do the things he used to do. But this kid, Rocky, I'd like to be around those. Now, that's going to be some egos right there. Well, they got to do WrestleMania. Yeah, now who's going to do the job for who? Rocky's a big movie star, too. Hunter Hearst Helmsley, he's a big star. Who's going to do the job? Austin's a big star. Yeah, it's gonna be... Vince McMahon, Vince has got them guys right where he wants them. What a power, what a, what a power It's going to be Sean and Brett all over again. Oh, of course. Speaking of that, uh, what are your thoughts on that whole situation of Survivor Series? and the one, the one thing in this business that I missed, and I left the building, and I was sitting no, no further than you and I were. We were on the same bench. There was Jim Nyhart. We were in, a, in, in, a, in a, like it's a hockey locker room, right. and there's a, a, a bench type thing, the cabinets with a the locker. There was Nyhart. Davey, Brett, me, Rick Root across the way, uh, Ron Simmons, a couple more people down through there, and Cactus was back in the back, and Paul Bear was over on the other side. I went there that day, they had nothing for me. Uh, Bruce Pritchard had come along and said, you know, we gotta come up with some way to get some publicity on the Honky Tonk Man. <laughs> Try put me on fucking TV. It might help, <laughs> you know. But anyway, I said the cameras are following Brett around, and 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 then all this that had been going on for about six, about six months, six weeks, eight weeks, two months or something. What a boring video that would have been to follow. You know, Brett's 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 expressionless. Nice. Brett and I are friends and everything. Expressionless. Blah 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 blah. Who wants to hear Bret Hart's story for a documentary? These these camera people. They they I mean this producer and director. They were lucky. They got some really great footage to make a good show uh, the last 45 minutes of tape was rolling. I knew when I left coming to Montreal, my wife once again asked me, she said, what do you think Bret Hart's going to do? You think he's going to do that job for Shawn Michaels? I said, no way. No way is Bret Hart going to do the job for, job for Shawn Michaels. Bret's not going to do the job for anybody, much less Shawn Michaels because they hate each other. Now, just a month before that, they'd been down on the floor at the Hartford Civic Center right. fighting, scratching, pulling each other's hair out. So there had been a, a, a vicious fight just four weeks prior to that. But that night, I was finished, had nothing to do. After I gave Pritchard my thought on television, I got in a cab and went back to the hotel. Missed the whole damn thing. And I was right there. I could have been there watching McMahon get the hell knocked out of him. <laughs> uh, did Brett hit him? Yeah. I, uh, Rue told me about it the next day. He said, you ain't going to believe what happened. I said, well, he's, Bret Hart beat the shit out of Mike Manley. I said, oh, he didn't. I, yeah, he did. He said, I was there. He said, they, they screwed him in the finish. He told me the whole story. I said, holy shit. Yeah, he whacked him. <laughs> <laughs> How close are you with your nephew, Brian Christopher? Uh, never close at all. He was a small child when I was in Memphis breaking in. Uh, he was never around his father at all. Uh, his dad disowned those children and, and his first wife the mother of those children and, and never had anything to do with them, never brought them around, nothing. So, I don't, I don't you know, other than somebody probably telling Brian that we're related, All right. doesn't mean anything to him. Was there any heat between you and Waller? He's a good talent, though. The kid's oh, good he's talent. Awesome. He's awesome. Good talent. He's just too small, once again, small guy, and living in the shadows of his old man. He'll never do anything there as long as his old man's there because his old man's always, a, oh, man, why'd you do that? Look at Brian out here. He, Brian shows up late one time for a, a Raw, and back then they were finding everybody 100 or something, $100 for being late. He shows up like two minutes late. Lawler goes right over to Arnold Skull and tells Arnold, said, look, Arnold, he's late, he's late. Find him. Find the bastard. Find him. He's late. I thought, here you are. You're his father, and you're saying this out loud in front of everybody for him to get fined. If I'd have been a kid, I'd pull him back in the back, kicked him in the ass. All right. Cause the kid could beat the shit out of the old man. Was there any heat between you and Lawler when you stepped in as Jim Morrison's partner? Uh, I'm sure there probably was, yeah. Because he, like I said earlier, that is a situation where it's harder, it's easier for a guy to get over in the ring, right? Wrestling than it is to get on that, uh, on that fast-moving, fast-paced show, and 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 get over there because see, Vince took me to 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 
Germany to work with him on a, a European pay-per-view. Didn't take Ross, didn't take Lawler, he took me. Vince, I went. I flew over there on the Concorde with the, with the production crew and everybody, and we did that show. Uh, Vince was using me a lot on the commentary. Vince Russo was the one who was writing me off the commentary. When Vince left the commentary booth, uh, I didn't get much commentary at all. When Jake Roberts was there and Jake was helping write TV, Jake would write me in to go do commentary. Vince Russo, as he got power, would write me out. The sheet would be up. I'm going out on this match. 20 minutes later, the new lineup would come up on the wall. I wasn't out. I'd go to Jake. Jake, I thought you said I'm going out on this. He said, you are. No, I'm not. They took me off of that. Shit, let me go talk to Vince. Jake would go tell Vince. Vince, they'd write me back in. So once Jake left, I got no more TV time. What are your views of uh, Russo? Uh, another power hungry. Gosh, you make yourself the world's champion. You go from making $75,000 a year uh, working for the WWF to making $750,000 a year. Somewhere, somehow, someone believed that Vince Russo turned the WWF around. Vince Russo didn't turn the WWF around. I think the Mike Tyson WrestleMania turned the WWF around. Uh, it was just, just the media coverage that securing Mike Tyson for that event changed the way people looked at the WWF and now they looked at their product different. And, and I don't know. Russo might have some good ideas about shock TV, but I just don't think hardcore every match and naked women is what f people want to view as any kind of family entertainment in prime time, even in cable. I don't think that's what people... That's, they don't want to see that in wrestling. They, they don't want to see it. Sure, do the guys want to see uh, somebody like a Kimberly come out b bouncing around with her tits shaking her ass hanging out? Sure. One time a night they want to see that, but they don't want to see every wrestler with a whole crew of girls. At one time there, Russo had 26 girls on contract, and I said, is there not room for at least one wrestler? Right, right. <laughs> out of 26 girls under contract, is there not room for one guy that can maybe go out there and sell some tickets? Right, right. <laughs> um, let's see, where's me going? Are you, was there any tension between you, Sean, and Hunter at all? No. 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 Are you surprised no. with uh, Hunter's success? Uh, no, he was uh, talented and uh, very talented. His interviews have come a long, long ways. Uh, I, I knew him when he was breaking in with Kowalski because I'd go there and do independent shows. He was a terrorizer. Right. Uh, always treated me with respect. Uh, and that's, uh, to me, as an older guy in the business, being treated with respect it's really all that matters. Uh, is he caught up, and was he caught up in the Shawn Michaels little click thing? Yeah, but he was able to overcome it and has surpassed wherever Michaels might have been nowadays. Right. Good talent. What are your views on, um, let's see, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall? Big lazy Kevin Nash is exactly what he is. Uh, overpaid and definitely overrated probably the least drawing as far as gate receipts WWF uh, heavyweight world's champion in the history of the WWF he didn't sell any tickets he's not very talented I think uh, he goes out and he talks about a new generation people being old but yet he's got the gray in his beard and he's got the gray in his hair and, uh, as far as Hall, Hall never impressed me as doing anything anything the question you have to say is he worth or was he worth 1.2 or 1.3 million dollars a year? Was he worth that? Is Kevin Nash worth 1.2 or 3 million dollars a year if they're not going to turn the company around and sell tickets? When you look at 600 people buying tickets or 1,000 people to buy tickets for a Monday Nitro and you're giving away 5,000 tickets, something's wrong with your main event players your top talent. Something's wrong with the Arizona Cardinals football team when their quarterback, Jake Plummer, is making all the money, but yet he can't produce. Something's wrong on a baseball team when your pitcher that's making $20 million can't strike anybody out. Changes have to be made, and if that company doesn't do it, probably by the time this gets out to the public, they're finished anyway. Right. What are your views on ECW? It's too bad because there was room and there was a place for a third company that could 
give young guys a place to break in. It's too bad they had to be so extreme that they lost their viewership and they lost their crowd that came to watch them. Uh, it's too bad that the guys that worked there so long and so hard totally destroyed their bodies, their young bodies, and have multiple surgeries on themselves now, and, and, and that they're not getting paid. There was a place for it. Uh, management, maybe Paul E. could have done some things different. Looking back, but hindsight's a whole different story. There was a spot for him. He took advantage of it when he had the chance. I'm glad they did it. I just wish they hadn't have went so extreme as much as they did to the extent they did because there again, they painted themselves into a corner with no way out except more extreme, and you can only go so far. I mean, there's only so high that Rod Van Dam can, can jump off a balcony or, or Sabu or so many chair shots you can do in one match, jump up and drop kick or throw a chair. And I mean, right. uh, if they would have just kept it at the level it was when it started, I think they'd still be around. How about uh, the Rockabilly character? Why do you think that didn't take off? Was that horrible? That was the most disgusting piece of work. I don't know if they... I, I, don't, I don't think they were trying to do anything to me at that point in time. They were punishing him. He was in punishment because he had threatened to leave. He and his partner had broken up, and he had threatened to leave to go to WCW, so they were punishing him. And then you hear Raw saying, that's a piece of one best piece of talent in the WWF. Well, I hear the reports now that Chris Benoit had to carry him around for 10 minutes in a match because he was so blown up he couldn't work. He's not a great worker. He's like a fish out of water. He just bumps around the ring, bing, bing, bing. Every time you hit him, he takes a bump, jumps up. He flops around like a fish out of water. And I told him, I said, Billy, you got one problem. You flop like a fish out of water. Uh, he got into the steroid thing and got all pumped up. And uh, I don't know. They ended up, he, here's, here's a, again, a guy says, hey, if you don't give me a better contract, I'm leaving. They turned around and gave him a better contract. Some people say, "Give me a, if you don't give me a contract, I'm leaving. You're out of here. Go. Uh, right. Why they kept him around, I don't know. Talent-wise, he hadn't he proved anything. I knew he wasn't. He was going to quit. They brought Van Dam in one night for the, when they had the yeah. Monday night, and uh, Van Dam was called Mr. Monday Night or something back right. then, and they were going to use Van Dam against Billy Gunn on TV, and Gunn came to me and said, I'll tell you one fucking thing. If they put Van Dam, Mr. Money, I ain't putting him over. I'll tell you that. I'm quitting. I'm quitting right now if they put me in a match with him. So he went around and told people that, and I guess they changed it. I kind of wish they would have. All right. What are your views on Sonny? Sonny was, uh, obviously she had some problems outside uh, uh, with some of her demons that she wasn't able to deal with. I never knew that. I thought she was a gorgeous I mean, this girl was beautiful. She really was. She was a very pretty girl. Tr she treated me with respect. I'm sorry to hear all the bad stuff that's happened to her. Uh, her and Chris both treat me with top-level respect. I enjoyed being around Sonny. Sonny would do things around me more professional than she would around other people. I heard stories about her being hard to deal with and wouldn't get out of a car and wanted, wouldn't come out of the hotel room and wouldn't go do a personal appearance. But when she was booked on something with me, she was there and did a really good job and was never a problem. I don't know if it was a respect for me or, or what. I think maybe Sonny knew that I probably wouldn't put up with her bullshit. A lot of people did. She was, you know, a, a little bit of a whining baby, but uh, it's too bad. But that's just how the WWF is. They got one superstar and Sonny, with, she's out there and she's the queen of the WWF. And all of a sudden, here comes that old stripper Sable in there. And, you know, and nice you know, and next thing you know, she goes and she has them things injected until they just get so huge, and now she's the queen. And Sonny and Sable just, boy, there was a, there was a struggle there. There was a fight. Do you think that the business is overexposed right now? Uh, well, the gate receipts tend to be falling a little bit. Viewership on television, I don't know. I haven't seen a lot of the television stuff, and I'm sure it's probably falling a little bit. It could be. There, it goes in cycles. I've always said this particular cycle would not last the eight or nine years like the other cycle did. The other cycle lasted I'm around nine years, right. maybe ten before it really took a nosedive. This one, when it takes a nosedive, it's going to fall hard. And Mac Mann is going to take a lot of people with him on this one. Stockholders. Do you... Um 
Well, actually, I was going to ask you where do you see the business in the next five years? Well, we saw in the last five years it's gone from heels and baby faces where they say there's no such thing as a good guy and a bad guy, and I'll dispute that. All of a sudden, you see Kurt Angle, he's a bad guy. Right. People hate him. Right. Uh, you know, it's funny. If there's no heels or baby faces, why isn't he not just in between? <laughs> but they see now that they need to start making that transition back to that. Somebody's got to come to watch somebody get beat. Somebody's got to come to watch someone win. You can't have these three-way dances and four-way dances that they have and all four guys be cheered by everyone and right. you know uh, it, it's going to go back it's gone from, and I was telling this to someone the other day imagine the young guys who broke in two three years ago and everything was lucha style because all the luchas were on TV doing Mexican style wrestling which I said fellas don't learn this stuff if you like it and you want to learn a couple of those moves learn the real basic professional wrestling this stuff will not last the lucha stuff is now gone. All those young guys that was trained and learned how to be lucha wrestlers, huh. they have to be retrained now. Right. They got to go back to wrestling school now. So, uh, it will go back to whatever it was. It makes a circle. It will go back to wrestling, and then it will go then to hardcore, and it'll go to lucha, and it'll it will make a complete cycle. It might take 20 years to do it. But you will see this cycle, and it's all written. Luchers are gone now. WWF is not using all the naked women anymore. Right. They're not using as much sexual overtone in their angles anymore, which, you know, they love to do that uh, for some reason. Uh, even the names they give, Brutus Beefcake. <laughs> well, Beefcake is the number, was at that time, the number one gay-selling magazine in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, maybe even around the world, Beefcake. And I guess in the gay community, the gays call it, oh, he's a brute. Oh, what a brute he is. <laughs> Brutus Beefcake. There's always something in those names. The the, the foul Venus and then uh, the narcissist. And now you got uh, uh, the Prince Albert. It's, we know it has something huh. to do with piercing of the sexual organs. And so right. the WWF has always played in that sexuality line and... and uh, I, you know, one of the best ones I, I, I got enjoyed. I didn't watch a lot of it, but what I did see when I saw it, I enjoyed was the Mark Henry with uh, uh, in oh, bed in bed with old May Young, and May <laughs> Young was pregnant. I, I, you know, that's the first time I really dabbled in that that end of it. Which right. made for it made for good TV. What was the best rib you've ever seen? Oh gosh, I. I there's been so many. There's been there's been bad ones, you know, with the Bulldogs, uh, Dynamite Kid. You know, sure, if he's got a problem with me. He was cutting Terry Taylor's clothes up, cutting his pants up, cutting his jackets up and stuff, you know. To me, that rip, when you destroy someone's property, it's not a rib. Uh, when you defecate in someone's food like they did with Sonny and right. defecate in someone's bag like they did with, with Sable, I didn't mind them defecating in Lawler's crown. Defecate means you take a dump in it. Right. <laughs> you know, I didn't mind them taking a dump in Lawler's crown. You know, he cried to Mike Mann about that, and they got a memo sent out, no more ribs in the WWF because Lawler cried about somebody squatting down and letting out some mess in his crown. Uh, I don't know. There's, I, I was never a big ribber, never was involved in too many, so I, I don't know. You know, the one we used to do was a good one. I had a spotlight, and we'd drive down the highway and pull the other boys over the spotlight, which wasn't, it wasn't really a good rib because, you know, if they were smoking the marijuana and had some pills, you know, you got to put right. it out, you might spill it and, you know, throw your beer out the window and everything. I was out behind Jack Mulligan one night, threw a bottle of whiskey out the window. He was so damn mad. He thought it was the cops. It was me. He threw his whiskey away. So I, just, that was a bad rib. It destroyed somebody's property. Right. Do you still keep up with the business today? Do you watch TV on? Our no, I don't watch it on. I don't watch it on TVs. There's just nothing interests me because WWF is, it's the five guys: Undertaker, Rocky, Mankind, and Stone Cold. They're the and uh, with Angle now being a little bit involved. But you got the five guys that's that's always against each other all the time. You got the total underneath guys that's killing himself trying to be the top guys, and none of them look that good. None of them have bodies on right. them or not big. WCW is all the wrestling school guys that WCW and, and obviously Vince Russo and those people have not ever realized you do not you do not just create superstars. They're just not superstars. People, these people that make it big 
they have to have something going for them. You just can't put them on TV one time, have them go out, do an interview, or have them hit somebody over the head with a guitar, or have them throw fire on somebody, and all of a sudden, have them beat Goldberg, and all of a sudden they're a superstar. Doesn't happen that way. Superstars are cultivated, they're grown. It takes time. To, it took two years to bring Rocky along. He uh, All of a sudden, he wasn't just The Rock. Right. He came in there as just Rocky, getting beat by people. I saw him get beat by a lot of people there. Then he was the Rookie of the Year, still lost some matches. Then he was The Rock. Then he got over. You know, it, it, it didn't. Stone Cold Steve Austin, he didn't get over there for a year, for maybe two years, until he started drinking beer and cursing on TV. You know, can you imagine the heat I would have had if I could have went out there and said, well, Macho Man, I got news for you. Saturday night at the Spectrum in Philadelphia, when I shake, rattle, and roll you, and I break your neck, and I send you out of here in a wheelchair, it's me and Liz, baby. Me and Liz are going to be doing something. We're going to be getting down. And you know what? I got two words that Liz is going to be doing for me on Saturday night after I finish you. Suck it. Now, can you imagine <laughs> right. if I could have gone on TV and said those kind of things? But we couldn't do that. We weren't able to go out and do that. We were able to sell tickets by keeping all this out. We didn't have to do it. All right, all if right. we did anything, we said we're going to shove this down your throat. Or I'm going to put this somewhere where the sun, even to say that where the sun doesn't shine. Ah, oh, you better not say that. <laughs> you know. Would you ever want a book or anything like that? No. 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 But no one, nobody would believe it. Nobody would believe it. All the books and everything's been written out here. I see, I go over and I pick Arn Anderson's book up. No, no, I mean, I mean would you want a book? Oh, a as book, far as no. booking. I thought you meant write a book. No, no, no. No, book wrestling? No, 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 no. I, I was never good on angles and finishes. I can look at an angle and see if it's, you know, my, I can, I can pick it apart and put something together on it later on once it starts to get going. Right. But, no, I was never good on that. I always cared about my performance only, not anybody else's. Right. Not anybody else's. What could I do in my match to make myself better? I really didn't care what other guys did. And I didn't really watch what they did. And I didn't think about, gosh, this would be good if we put this guy with him and this guy with her. No. Uh, as far as writing books, nah. It's just like I said, I'd turn this book over to Arn Anderson, I think. Now, is he going to say, in his first match, he wrestled Bob Armstrong on Dothan TV. Did he mention that Bob Armstrong went to pick him up and pulled his toupee off? And he had his toupee glued on and glue and it tore the skin off his head and everything. He never mentioned that. So why not mention that? Did Bob Armstrong pull my toupee off? But see, he left out an important part. That was a very important part of his first match on TV. Right. He hadn't forgotten that. Every time I see him, I look up at his head. He goes, you know, I quit wearing the damn toupee and my hair started growing. The cactus is, the, the, and, I, and I love Cactus Jack. He, I guess he, he mentioned me in his book that something about my gimmick, how Jeff Jarrett destroyed it. But did Cactus tell all the story? Did he tell a story about how he wears the same clothes? He wrestles in the clothes and he wears them. I mean, he don't even change. You know, here's a guy that's made millions of dollars. Come on, Cactus, for Christ's sakes. You're going to spend it in income tax? Get some new clothes. Rocky, 30 years old. He's writing a book about his life. His life is what? My five years in the wrestling business? How I dedicate my book to Vince and Linda McMahon and Shane and Stephanie? Oh, yeah. When they ask you to put the rock over, are you going to still dedicate that book to them? Why, hell no. <laughs> Do you have any regrets? Yeah, I probably could have done some things different. Uh, I probably let my personal emotions interfere with my business emotions that shouldn't have happened on a few occasions but there comes a time when a person has to when you look in that mirror every time you look in a mirror you have to remember that the people you're trying to satisfy aren't in the mirror looking back at you there's always only that one person that's looking back at you in that mirror and that's you and that's the person you really got to live with. So, sure, we've all got regrets about some things. Personal emotions interfering with business emotions, probably my biggest one. Sometimes I let things get a little bit bigger than they should have been, or I let them build up to a point where it boiled over, and I should have probably cut it off before it started to boil, which causes... Uh, a lot of hardship, 
hard feelings. All right. Emotions toward people you shouldn't have. In closing, do you have anything to say to your fans? I'm out there somewhere every night. 120 shows a year. Gosh. 20 independent wrestlers on every show. That's 200 a month. 2,000 young boys that want to break into wrestling business. If you have a job, keep your job. Use the wrestling business as a hobby unless someone signs you to a big contract and just throws money at you. Otherwise, use it as a hobby. Have fun with it. Do not kill yourself. This business is supposed to be fun. It's fake. It's phony. You shouldn't be out there killing yourself. Holy Christ, guys. Get with it. I guess that's really it. Do you have any questions? Look, definitely thank you for your time. It's been a great thank interview. You. Thank you very much. Thank you.